A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahi Rahmanir Rahim Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu First I'd like to thank Sisters of Jannah for the honor and the privilege of being able to come here and talk with you today. I've been asked to talk about living a life of purpose. Living a life of purpose. In life we all have role models. We have people we admire, people we look up to. And role models are all about good character, good conduct. There is no gender that is better than another when it comes to conduct. Even in the eyes of Allah in Surah Al-Hujurat, he says superiority in his eyes is based on our God consciousness, on our character, on behavior. So men, are, men and women are both meant to be torchbearers, both meant to be role models of Islam in everything we do. Not only in our character, in our conduct, in the utterances, the words that come out of our mouths. So Allah makes that responsibility for both men and for women. And there's so much to be done. But we can't do everything. However, we can start somewhere. Everybody here has somebody they admire. Somebody they look up to. What is it you see in others that makes you wish you could be like them? What is it you admire in others? How do we become like those we admire? Most importantly, how do we become the ones that others will admire? We all have responsibility. Everybody here has something that they do, that they're responsible for. And often we find there isn't enough time to do everything. We get bogged down with routines. We wake up in the morning, we have things we do, and at the end of the day we reflect. And often we find there's still stuff we have not been able to do or accomplish. We have long to-do lists. Often things we really want to do, but we find that we are at the bottom of our own to-do list and at the top of other people's agenda. So we have to satisfy their needs first before we start working on ourselves. We get overwhelmed and burnt out. There was a man who was walking in the woods one day and he saw another man trying to cut down a huge tree. So as he kept watching this guy, he kept hacking away, hacking away, hacking away at this tree. He noticed the man was not making any progress. All he saw was about just a couple inches of that tree having been cut and this man was using an ax. He watched him hacking, hacking, and still no progress. So he asked him, uh, sir, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm trying to cut down this tree. He said, but you don't seem to be making any progress. He said, yeah, I know. My axe is blunt. He said, so why don't you go sharpen your axe? The man said, no, I don't have time. I'm too busy for that. He continues hacking away, making absolutely no progress. A lot of us feel like this man. A lot of us feel that we are spinning our wheels, but we're not going anywhere. We're busy, but we're not productive. We're busy, but we're ineffective. We're busy, but we're not going forward. We need to get ourselves in order. We need to sharpen our own sores for us to be that inspiration for others, for us to be the light for others. So we need to sharpen our soul. Sometimes we reach a stage in our lives where we want change. We want something different, something new. We feel this emptiness inside that something is missing and that we could be more, we could do more. Or sometimes we admire others, how they conduct themselves, what they are doing, and we wish we could be like that. We want more meaning in our lives, more fulfillment. We want to feel that we have a greater purpose than what we are doing now. We want to be closer to Allah. We want to have a reason to wake up in the morning. Sometimes you want to shine, but you feel your battery is running low. You could do more, but something is holding you back. We have all had and all have dreams and expectations of things we want to be, what we want to do at this stage in our lives. 
Are you living your dream now? What you started doing years ago, is that what you're doing today? What was your vision of what you thought you'd be doing? Are you feeling fulfilled with your daily actions, what you're doing? Are you content? Are you satisfied? Are you living your best life? Are you on track? Or do you feel deep inside that you are worth more than what you are today? But something is weighing you down. What is holding you back? What is that thing that's holding you back? Those goals you want to achieve, are they not significant? Are they not meaningful? What is holding you back? Or are you your own self-saboteur? Are you the one who is giving excuses as to why you cannot do and why you cannot be? As role models of the faith and promoters of Islamic values, as role models, how can we execute the trust that Allah has bestowed upon us to live a meaningful life? Because Allah wants us to be useful, to live a life with substance and meaning. And he has placed this huge responsibility on our shoulders. He has given us a massive responsibility. And he says in Surah Al-An'am, For he it is who has made you vicegerents. For he it is who has made you vicegerents, his khalifas, his representatives, his ambassadors. For he it is who has made us his representatives on this earth. What does representing Allah mean to you? How much thought have you given to the fact that Allah wants you to represent him as his ambassador? For he it is who has made you. It's not that he's saying he's going to make you, but he has made you his ambassadors on earth. Do you ever, ever give it much thought? What does it mean to represent Allah? How does it affect the way you think? How does representing Allah affect the way you speak, the way you talk to people, the way Allah would? How does it affect the way you behave with your family, friends, at school, at work? How are you representing Allah in all your interactions? He said he has made you. He is not going to, but he has made you his representatives. Representing Allah means behaving. Behaving the way Allah would if he were here on earth. It is using all the gifts that he has blessed us with to represent him well, to serve him, to be useful to ourselves and to be useful to others. Allah has equipped us with all the tools we need to represent him. Some of us unfortunately start looking at others and believing Allah has blessed some more than us. Either from the background they come from, the wealth they have, their education, and we say this person has a head start. They are more privileged. Allah has blessed them more. Allah says he has made you his representatives. And we come up with all sorts of reasons and excuses why we cannot do and why we cannot be. I often say, if Allah gives you a candle, take it and shine your light with it brightly. If he gives you a torch, do not look at the person with the floodlight, but look at what you have and believe that Allah gave you this for a reason. Because in that same verse of Surah Al-An'am, he says, and he has raised you by degrees among, above others. He has raised some of us above others so that he might try us by means of what he has blessed us with. So if we do have a torch, Allah wants to try us with that torch. What do you do with it? Then will you stop looking over your shoulder and know that that was a gift from Allah and he knows you can use it very, very well to represent him. Have you stopped to think when he says by means of what he has bestowed upon you? Have you stopped to think of what it is he has bestowed upon you? How many actually reflect 
What are the gifts that Allah has blessed me with? And what am I meant to use it for? We all have opportunities. We all have opportunities to do our very best with what Allah has bestowed upon us. Unfortunately, there is so much going wrong because a lot of us sit back and become bystanders. Or some people choose to watch as wrong goes on around them and they do nothing else. Instead, they hate it in their hearts. Your neighbor's child is on drugs. It's so easy for us to blame it on poor parenting. It's so easy for us to condemn that child and talk about what went wrong. But you find at one stage, by ignoring them, you hesitate to let your child go out and play with that child. Why? Because they could influence them. It could come home to you. Your kids end up becoming prisoners in their own home. Why? Because you were not concerned about what was going on outside your home. It becomes your problem. Instead, we have opportunities to counsel that child, to suggest rehab, there are so many alternatives and to try and cut the sources of the drugs that are affecting your neighborhood. Somebody told me you can hardly find one neighborhood today in Abuja that there isn't a drug problem. It is rare to find a home that has not been affected. It has reached that stage. But there's always something we can do. Sometimes we lose out on this great opportunity because Allah has bestowed us with the ability to do and we look at others who are using what they have been blessed with and we admire from a distance mashallah wow this sister is really trying or this organization is trying what are you doing what's holding you back presently what can people say about you what can people say about you you cannot afford to be good alone or good for nothing. Sometimes we are so humble, we do the right thing, we're a good Muslim, but we keep it to ourselves while wrong goes on around us. I say that is not good enough because we are meant to act, we're meant to do more. So it's not good enough to be good alone, and it's not good enough to be good for nothing. What are you known for? Ask yourself, what can I do to be significant? to others, to someone, even if it is a child, or in my neighborhood, can I organize the young children to clean up? Is there something you can do? Can I counsel a teenager? How can I be a positive influence on my spouse? I had a discussion with my husband this morning, just before I came. He called and we were talking, and then I said, oh, I met so-and-so, and he said, hmm because that person has had a reputation of questionable character. And I said, Said, pray for him. May Allah guide him aright, because he may have changed from what we know. He prayed for me. He said, Mariam, thanks for the reminder. So what kind of influence do you have on your spouse? How significant are you to a school? Do you have something you can share? And what about your friends? What kind of advice? How can you make a difference? There is always an, a need out there. There is always a demand out there. And you probably have what it takes if you look deep inside to solve problems. Think about the things that you consider to be problems out there. Things that are burning deep inside of you, that concern you, that you're worried about. Think about those things that matter the most to you. Things you are passionate about. There's always a need out there. There's a demand. Think about solutions. Is it something you can do alone or do you need others to support you? If your friends are friends, your friends should have similar interests as you do. How can you involve them? Is there an organization you can partner with? But there is always a solution, and you have to see yourself as a problem solver. I love the quote that says, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I even go further, I say, you are a problem yourself. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem.
What are you doing to solve instead of complain about the things that are going wrong? The Prophet ﷺ said, the best amongst you are those who are the most useful. The best are the most, not just useful, but the most useful. So what are those concerns you have and how can you be useful towards it? There's an organization in Abuja that once invited me to give a lecture. And they organize lectures a lot on marriage, on personal development, growth, family. And it was just two friends that started it. Two friends that were just chatting and sharing things to do with growth and development. And they were like, why should we keep this to ourselves? Why shouldn't we open it out? Because there may be others that will benefit the way we are benefiting, the way we are growing. So they established this organization and called it Ideal Woman. And they're giving lectures, inviting people. They have another branch in Kaduna. I was also invited there. And it just started in their homes, just two friends chatting. And they're making a difference. They're strengthening the bonds between spouses and families. There was a man who set up a WhatsApp group for teenagers to counsel them. Right now, he has over 1,600 youth following him that he counsels and mentors, gives advice, records videos on things and challenges that they face in their daily lives. There was a young boy, he's 17 years old today, and while he was still in high school, in secondary school, he would counsel his juniors in JS1, JS2, and JS3 about the challenges you face at that age as a teenager of being called antisocial, of friendship, and how to select good friends, and developing your brand, making sure you know who you are so you can't be influenced easily with negative peer pressure. There was a lady who went through abuse in her home, and she set up from the comfort of her home a Facebook group chat where others who have been through similar experiences could talk, find comfort, and share advice with one another. Sisters of Jannah started with an idea, probably from one person who shared it with another. And here we are today, learning, growing. I've learned from my brother today. There's a young girl who graduated from our high school. She was our head girl, but she set up an opportunity on Facebook where she can highlight everyday Muslim heroes, women, girls, who are making a difference. Her name is Amina Abdurrahman. So she set up this thing called the al Majira Initiative. And it's on Instagram. And you get to read profiles of people who are doing everyday small acts, but they are heroes, and she's celebrating them. Here we have Brother Abdul Fattah, who is an artist, actually who does Islamic art and calligraphy, sharing a gift that Allah has blessed him with. And like you can see, Allah blesses people with multiple gifts, but he's making the world more beautiful by sharing a gift that Allah has blessed him with. The colors he uses, the curves, the lines, it moves you. Wallahi, I mean it sincerely. These are gifts and this is making a difference. Some people have the gift of poetry, writing. You, each and every one of you have a gift. And sometimes there is a tragedy that we do not open that gift that Allah has blessed us with. There's a story of a man who was walking on a beach early one morning. And this man noticed that the night before, the starfish had been washed ashore from the waves. So he had to watch where he was treading. But the sun was rising and he realized that these thousands of starfish that had been washed ashore were going to die. But in the near distance, he noticed there was a figure, a man that kept bending down, standing up, bending down, standing up. And as he got closer, he realized that this man was bending down, picking up starfish, and throwing them into the ocean, one by one. He got close enough. After looking at this man for a while, he said, sir, what are you doing? And the man said, oh, I'm saving the starfish. 
He said, but there are thousands of them. You can't possibly make a difference. He bent down, picked up a starfish, threw it in the ocean. He said, but I made a difference to that one. And that's what we are here for making a difference. The deeds loved the most by Allah are those done regularly, even if they are small. We don't need to do big things to make a difference. We don't need to build a mosque. We don't need to set up a huge organization. Sometimes just two people is enough to make a difference. Sometimes and often even you alone, you alone have it in you. Partnering is only making things stronger. The power in numbers but you have the gift in you and often like i said the tragedy is we do not look deep within to see what it is that allah wants us to do what is that thing burning inside of you that you are yearning to do that when you look in the mirror at who you are today you feel i can do more i can be more than this so what is holding you back What is that thing that you've been longing for? What is that thing that's been burning deep inside of you? That thing that if you do it, you don't mind if you don't get paid. What is so good about doing what you love, what you're passionate about, is the quality is always greater. And people eventually will be ready to pay for it. And then you find you're able to earn a living. But if it isn't something that you're going to make money on, do it because that's what gives your life meaning. That is your true calling. Don't wait for divine intervention to make you start something you love. You already have it. Allah says he has made you. He has given you willpower. He's given you a choice to pick what it is you want to do. He has given you a conscience to know right from wrong. He has given you life. He has given you health. He has given you time. And he is right there by your side. He would never leave you to represent him alone and not be there with you on the journey. Don't wait for a sign. Don't wait for a burning bush. I remember wanting to make a decision to start something. And it took me three months. I would think about this spend the night thinking about what I could do, how I could do, and I would ask my husband, I would ask some close friends, what do you think? And they all said, go for it. My husband says, do it. What are you waiting for? Three months later, I asked him again, Said, what do you think? I'm still thinking about this thing. Should I? Mariam, you want an angel to drop from the sky, slap you on the face and tell you, start? He said that to me, and I started. And I have never till today found more fulfillment, more peace from what I am doing. That thing that I kept thinking about, overthinking about, second guessing myself, trying to find excuses and even being negative about what would go wrong, I just started. So don't wait. Don't wait. Do your homework. Do your istikhara. So Allah puts his blessings in it. But like I said, don't overthink. Do shura. Ask people who care for you. And then put your trust in Allah. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, when, when you have taken a decision, put your trust in Allah, for Allah loves those who put their trust in him. When you've made a decision to do something, put your trust in him. And I love the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu said, I quote this almost at every lecture. If you put your whole trust in Allah as you ought, he most certainly, he most certainly will satisfy your needs as he satisfied those of the birds. They come out hungry in the morning and return satisfied to their nests. I planted a lot of trees in my garden and it's been the biggest blessing because every evening if I'm home, I sit outside Around 6.15, 6.30, the birds come back and they remind me of Allah because I feel the way they are singing and chirping, making so much noise. It's a huge orchestra going on in the trees. They're all coming back satisfied. And that is the fulfillment you will have as you put your head on your pillow at the end of the day. You feel satisfied because Allah will completely fulfill your needs, grant you peace of mind 
grant you contentment. This is what leading your life is about. This is having a meaningful life. Not sitting back and watching others, being the passengers of other people, but taking charge and being the driver. Being the driver. And being an inspiration, because that is it. Others are watching. And what are we teaching those that are looking up to us? Our siblings, our children, the children in our neighborhoods, and then the community, and the Ummah. Because each and every one of us is representing Allah as his vicegerents. So we are a part of a puzzle in this big universe of ours. And each of us has a responsibility to fulfill. If I may just do a quick survey and through a show of hands, you can raise your hands. How many here today did not have somebody influence them in any way or motivate them? How many didn't have somebody significant in their lives? Just raise your hands if nobody influenced you. You can look around, look behind you. I'm not seeing a single hand go up. There's one person, Mashallah. Now, let me ask the next question. How many in this room had somebody influence them positively or support them or encourage them one way or another? Or was there a cheerleader? Just raise your hands up high. You can look around. If I were to ask that question of the people you know, how many of them would raise their hands and say, you are that person? I think a quarter, not even a quarter of the row raised their hands. Many of us remember the teachers that influenced us when we, when we were in school, or inspired us, or counseled us. People that we've come along or met on our journey. What are you to others? I'd like you to think about the people you admire, the people you consider to be role models. What virtues or qualities or strengths of that person do you admire? Think about it. What do you look at in somebody you admire and say, boy, I wish I had those qualities? Then how can you improve on it? Because I always say, don't go and try to be like others. Because an imitation is always a counterfeit. Create your own regional signature and style. Look at what others are doing. Yes, qualities they have and try to emulate. But don't try to be just like somebody. Always try for originality. Someone I've always looked up to and admire so much is my mother. She's been a huge inspiration in my life. Why? Because she lives in a world of possibilities. Everything is possible. You cannot tell her it cannot be done. And she's a fighter. She's tenacious. And she taught me to stand tall and fight and make things happen. She's a trailblazer. She started various organizations and schools and set a certain standard. She's also extremely creative, kind-hearted, gentle. She has a clean conscience and she doesn't have time for ego or pride. She taught us about humility and about service. I look at her as, as an inspiration, but I always remember the words of my father. Improve upon it. Everything you do, improve upon it. Everything you see, improve upon it. And that is my goal. What I've picked up from my mom and other role models I've been privileged to come across. I want to do better. I want to do more. And I want to use the one that God has blessed me with to bring this to life. So what words or phrases would you like people to describe you with? When you go back, do that as a little homework. Write it down. What do I want people to know me by? For If you have an image in your mind of who you want to be, what you want to do, it gives you a target. The next thing is, how do I bring it to life? Do I need to add skills to that thing I like so that I can be more efficient, far more productive and better? Then set a timeline. I want to achieve this by this particular time. 
So what's your plan of action? You need to write it down and then convert it into action. And it's not about, I will start tomorrow. I will start the moment I have put it in writing as a goal. The changes that you seek, the things you long for, will never come to life unless you take that first step. Many of us think changes are going to happen on their own. Like my brother Abu Fatah said, you can't sit and do nothing and expect things to improve. You have to put in, you have to invest in yourself. You have to work towards those goals you want. In the quotes that he also mentioned in Surah Torah, Allah won't change our conditions unless we change what lies within ourselves. We won't get better. Allah won't fill in the blanks until we take that first step towards what He wants us to be. For the changes to happen, we have to have a purpose. How many have stopped and thought about what is their reason for existence? Why are you here? What is your purpose? What are you meant to achieve? How many have given it much thought? The Prophet said, He was asked, He was asked, Who is the cleverest of believers? And you know what he said? The one who remembers death and is better prepared for the life after it. The one who remembers death and is better prepared for the life after it. There's an exercise I'm going to do with you now. And I know my time is limited. I have about 30 minutes to wrap up. Let's go through this journey together. You're meant to close your eyes, but I know it's quite difficult when there's a large group to do this. However, let's just go on this journey and try and pretend as if there's no child crying, there are no people walking around, there's no distractions. Just put yourself in a zone and go on this journey with me, please. It's the end of the day and you're going home. And as you get closer to the gates of your house, you get closer to your compound, you notice a large gathering of people outside the house. And as you step into your compound, your blood runs cold. Because the crowd is so unusual, but the faces are familiar. Then there is a sound that makes you uncomfortable. It's the sound of wailing, the sound of crying, and the sound of sobbing and murmuring. As you get closer, you realize that somebody has passed away. And there's a janaiza in progress. Why didn't they wait for you? Then you look around and panic. It's my children. But no. You see your sister holding on to them. One is confused and doesn't know what has happened. The other one is in shock, is crying and sobbing uncontrollably. Then you think again, is it your husband? No, but he's standing there, looking numb. Is it your mother? Oh my God, it's your mother. And you run around looking for her. Then you see her holding onto her chest, sitting in a heap on the floor. Nobody can comfort her. Who can it be? As you make your way to the center of the congregation, you now see that there's a body wrapped in a shroud. And at that moment, you realize that body is yours. Your life has come to an end. And they start to pick you up and put you in the van and are about to go and bury you. What are they saying about you? Who were you? What kind of life did you lead? How many lives did you touch? What kind of child were you? What kind of daughter? What kind of son? What kind of sister? What kind of brother? What kind of mother, what kind of husband were you? It's time.
time to face your maker. And as they cover you with sand, you re reflect on your life. Are you ready? Are you ready to face your maker? Your life has come to an end. For those who have closed their eyes, you may open your eyes. How did that feel? Scary. I noticed tears. I noticed this shock when you learned that it was you. How many of us know that we'll live to see the end of today? Just raise your hands if you do. How many are ready to face their maker? Just raise your hands. How many feel confident? I don't see more than four hands go up. So what are you waiting for? When you have no guarantees, what are you waiting for? Assume you had six months, just six months to live a healthy life. And after that, your life will come to an end. I'd like you to ask yourself these questions. What are the three things that matter the most to you in your life right now, today? What matters the most to you? What are the three things that matter the most to you? If you didn't bring a writing material, you can reflect on this when you go back home. And what are the three things you would like to do, achieve, before your six months expire? And the last question, what are the three things you want to be remembered for after you're gone? What are the three things you want to be remembered for after you're gone? Right now, that thing that you are pursuing so desperately, that thing that you are fighting for, sacrificing everything for, is it significant? Is it what people will remember you for after you're gone? In Surah al Kafir, Allah reminds us that the mutual rivalry for accumulating the things in this world distracts us from the most important things until we visit the grave. Right now, what is that thing we are pursuing so badly that we must have? Many of you, if you are asked, what are the three things that matter the most to you, will be the same as the results of a survey conducted of people who had a terminal illness, who knew they were going to die, and they were asked, what matters the most to you? The first thing they say is making peace with God. The second thing is making peace with their loved ones. Being at peace with their loved ones. And the third thing is leaving a lasting legacy. If those are the three most important things that matter to us and we don't know how long we're going to be living for, what are we doing today to make sure that like the Prophet said, we live our lives with minimum regrets? What would your family say about you? Like I asked, what kind of wife or husband were you? What kind of mother or daughter, sister or brother? And then the people you interact with, what kind of neighbor were you? What kind of employer or employee were you? What are you going to start today? What are you going to start so that others will want to emulate you? The Prophet said that he whose two days are equal in accomplishment is a sure loser. If you choose to wake up, wake up in the morning and do exactly what you did the day before, you have a routine and you don't stretch yourself and go into new territory, the Prophet describes that he whose two days are equal in accomplishment is a sure loser. So having that purpose gives our life meaning gives our life a compass, or like my brother says, a personal kibla. Living a life of purpose gives us a reason to wake up in the morning. But many of us go with the flow. What are we doing? We're just chilling. The Prophet said the intelligent person is the one who calls his own self to account and works for the hereafter. And the incapable is the one who follows his own desires without no control over it and then prays to Allah to forgive him. After he's gotten himself in trouble, that's when we ask for forgiveness. You will never be remembered for things you did just for yourself. But you'll always be remembered for things you did to and 
for others. Remember these questions. I ask you, please constantly ask this question to yourself. How significant am I to others? The next question. Is my presence felt? Is my presence felt? Do people know I exist? And will my absence be noticed? Is your presence felt? Are you making a difference? Are you making a contribution? Do people know you exist? And if you are no longer there, who will know? Who will notice your absence? And then, finally, that last question. What is your legacy? What do you want to be remembered for after you are gone? So where do you start and what should you focus on? There is a quote from Zayn Pavez that says, There isn't enough time to do everything in life. But there is enough time to do the most important things. There is enough time to do the most important things. And the Prophet advised Muslims to take advantage of five things before five others. The first one he says is take advantage of your life before your death. Your life before your death. Your good health before your ill health. Your good health before your ill health. Your free time before your preoccupation. Your youth before your old age and your wealth before your poverty. I want to leave you with two areas that I have found to be so useful. There are so many more. I can give you five, but we're short of time. I just want to leave you with two gifts, two areas that truly can give your life more meaning and more fulfillment. The first is spirituality, becoming more God conscious. My father always raised us to remember, Allah first in everything you do, Spirituality. Keep Allah close to you, close to you when things are going well and when they're not going well. Keep him close. Don't do anything that will displease him and don't be a seasonal Muslim. Many of us have just finished Ramadan and wow, the sacrifices we make during that month, how we control our utterances, the extras we do. And then Ramadan is over and believe me, we actually fall back to our old ways so easily. We find it's more difficult to get up at night. More difficult to even wake up for subhu. Why can we maintain this for one whole month, almost 30 days, and we can't manage to even add some of those things during the week, even if it's once? The extras. Develop a strong spiritual immune system. Why? This system is made up of taqwa. Immunizing yourself is protecting yourself from so much. Just like we immunize against us against diseases, having taqwa immunizes us, get us against the disease of the heart. Having taqwa is that God consciousness, being aware of God and fearing offending Him. Having taqwa keeps us on the Surat al Mustaqim, it keeps us on the straight path. If we are conscious of Him, if we are conscious of Him and His injunctions, He will make sure, and we represent Him well, He will make sure that He takes care of all our needs. If we are conscious of Allah, Allah says, and for everyone who is conscious of Allah, He always prepares a way out and provides for Him from sources He could never imagine. If we are conscious of Allah, He will provide for us from sources we couldn't imagine. Whatever you pray for, whatever you pray for, be certain that it will be responded to. But be patient. Because sometimes the time you pray for something, Allah will not grant it to you. Why? He wants to test your patience. Why? Because that's not the right time. He may not grant you what you want, but be patient. He will give you something better. So do the extras, the ones you did during the month of Ramadan, the extra zikr. Often we find we're able to hold the chasti or have that little um, rosary tikka during the month of Ramadan. Do it beyond. Learn the meaning of the Quran. Learn the message to us from Allah. And keep him close. Don't ever involve a middle man between you and Allah. Allah is sufficient for you. You don't need an intermediary. Be careful not to be one of those who is too infatuated with learning how to recite and how you pronounce and you don't learn the meaning of the Quran and translate it into your actions.
Do not ever lose the message. Learn the meaning, but learn the pronunciation so that you are saying the right thing. Be careful focusing on having the sunnah look, but you're not behaving in the sunnah way. Be very careful. Are you fooling people with your looks? Are you fooling people in a way that if they really got to know who you are, like my brother said, when they get to know what you do behind closed doors, they wouldn't want to be in your company. Are you more infatuated with the exterior? Giving people an impression of who you are on the outside and by the time they know who you truly are, who you are behind closed doors, it's nothing to be proud of. Because you're a Muslim doesn't make you a good person. Because you wear hijab doesn't make you pious. Because you grow a beard doesn't mean you don't steal, cheat or lie. Because you grew up in a Malam's home or a Sheikh's home or an Alfa's home doesn't make you better than any other Muslim. Some of us have quotes on the tips of our tongues. We're quick to impress people with our spiritual superiority. And we're quick to judge. I often will say, how dare you? Start with yourself because you don't know what's going on in somebody's heart and it's their relationship with their God, not their relationship with you. Whatever is in their heart, you can't possibly know. Don't judge people. Umar radiallahu anhu said, call yourself to account before Allah calls you to account. Spend your own time focusing on calling yourself to account and don't keep looking outwards and judging people. If, the, if Allah can forgive a prostitute for saving a dog, from thirst, then who are we to judge people and condemn them? It's so important that your Islam is in your intentions. That we should understand that our intentions and the content of our heart that gets translated into our actions is what makes us complete Muslims. Our good intentions. Some people here may have lost their job. Some may have lost a loved one and the pain is still so deep and the shock from their absence. Some may be going through a divorce and the devastation and the depression that comes with it. Some may have a child that is on drugs. Some may be going through financial hard times. These are all trials that many of us are going to go through. It is important that we develop a spiritual shock absorber. The way we put shock absorbers in our vehicle so that it takes the shock from our bodies. We need to develop a spiritual shock absorber to help us cope when Allah tries us. So that we are never victims of Allah's trials. Because Allah has said in Surah Al-Baqarah, and most, and most certainly we shall try you. Allah has already promised, and most certainly guaranteed we shall try you by means of danger, hunger, loss of your worldly goods, of lives and of the fruits of your labor. But I love the best part. He says, but give glad tidings, give good news to those who are patient in adversity, whom when calamity befalls them, they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajimun. They say, verily, from our sustainer we came, and verily, to him is our return. It is they upon whom descends the blessings, the mercy, the rahma of their sustainer, and it is they who are on the right path. So remember, he says, and most certainly we shall try you. Having that spiritual shock absorber gives us a mechanism to cope so that we never take trials personally. Many times something happens to us, we say, oh Allah, why me? Why not you? Who do you suggest? ever be a victim. Allah is just. I was privileged enough to meet one of our students who went through a huge trial from Allah. I have about 13 minutes to go and I'll wrap up. But this girl went through a trial. She lost her mother and her stepmother in one accident. Then not long after that, a few weeks later, she lost her brother who was electrocuted, something to do with the generator. From the shock of all that, she lost her grandfather less than a month later. But I've never met someone who changed and tried.
transformed this trial from Allah into being an inspiration to others. I call her my ray of sunshine because she never walked around like a victim. When she felt her heart heavy, she would talk about it, but she was always smiling, always cheerful. You would never know this is what she went through. Someone really close to me lost a child. She was pregnant, and when she came to deliver, the child passed away. And about six months later, she lost her husband in a ghastly car accident. I had to break the news to her. And I'll never forget, and I continue to pray to Allah to give me that kind of strength in faith. Because as I sat next to her, she was looking at me, shaking her head, in disbelief of what I was about to tell her. I said, Inna lillahi wa inna She sighed. She got up. She went and did ablution and just started doing nafilas. I continue to pray to Allah that when various trials come my way, that I will have that kind of trust that only Allah can fill the void in my heart. That is developing a spiritual or shock absorber. Mentally picturing things happening and preparing yourself for how you will behave so that you never go into shock. We are often victims, but when he blesses us, we don't complain. We don't say, why me, Anna? Why did you bless me with a child? Why did you bless me with financial independence? We don't complain about the good. Don't forget and comfort yourself. Part of the spiritual shock of Zorba is Allah tests those that he loves most. And he'll never give you a burden greater than you can handle. And he also said, after hardship will come ease. My brother said, it is during the darkest nights that the stars shine the brightest. And it is during the darkest hours that we are meant to shine the brightest. And that's when Allah is close to us. You shine your light with taqwa. You shine your light with iman. And trust that there is a lesson for you to learn. And you pray. Just as you worked hard to pass your tests. You fasted to pass your exams. Make sure you prepare yourself for Allah's tests. This is what is important. Be a source of healing for others. If you've gone through this, this is where you can be useful. You know where it hurts the most. Be a source of sorrow. So the first one is spirituality. Think of an activity you can do consistently, even if it's once a day, or once a week, or maybe twice a month, that will strengthen your Iman and bring you closer to Allah. Think about something you can do, but write it down. Put it in a reminder in your phone so that you will do it regularly, so you do not forget. The second and the last gift I want to part with you in is your mental and intellectual development. Develop your mind and develop your talents. Talk to others who also and keep company of those who do the same. Are you making the best use of your education? Are you finding fulfillment in that course that you studied? Are you putting it to good use? I am doctor, this professor, that. Architect, this engineer, that. In what way have others benefited from this knowledge you have acquired? It is never too late to start afresh. I know people who love what they study, but they choose to start something else because they're passionate about it. It's never too late. Try a new course. Learn a new skill. Learn something new. Never ever be stagnant. Learn skills like crafts. I met this gentleman when I went to the UK recently for a lecture. And I loved. He said he studied civil engineering. However, he wasn't finding fulfillment in that. So he went online and started taking courses on interior decoration because that was something he felt he had a gift for. And flipping homes, where he takes an old house that has been condemned, rejected, and he transforms it and brings it back to life and then sells it. So but what stood out for me is the high school he went to. He brings 10 students during their holidays to join him and he teaches them the same skill. That is being useful. How do you fine tune your current skills and yourself? How do you fine tune your talent? Learn organizational skills. You may have a message, 
learn public speaking skills, develop yourself, learn how to coach teenagers, learn to be a counselor. You have a gift that Allah has given you. Let the world benefit from who you are as a representative of Allah. Use the net wisely. Sadly, many of us use social media to follow strangers, to gossip, to envy about their lifestyle, and we end up wasting our lives. Use the internet wisely to develop yourself. Turn your phone into a classroom. Right now I have so many audible books, audio books in my phone that I listen to in my earpiece when I'm going for a walk, when I'm alone, and I grow from them. Use YouTube as the best teacher that is very economical compared to going to a school while you can learn in the comfort of your home from your phone or your laptop. My son is 21, but he learned how to record videos, to do videos, film, as well as learning sound engineering all on YouTube. He's the one who, do, who does all my videos today. He's only 21 and he never learned it formally. Learn these skills. There are ebooks available free. Whatever you are passionate about, just Google it and it will pop up and you'll see the free ones. There are tons of online courses that will help you develop and grow. Take advantage of developing your mind and talent and let people benefit from it. Coursera.org is a resource. I take four courses simultaneously, even right now, on Coursera to develop myself and future learn. These are all free courses. Some you pay for if you want. But never ever be stagnant. Make yourself an asset and let people learn from it. Think about one thing that you can do that you can add to what you already have that will develop your mind and develop your talent and please let people learn from you, let people benefit from you. My brother mentioned that the only difference maybe between us and Adam and Eve is that they don't have a label, they don't have a belly button because they weren't carried in the womb. And there is no difference between us and all those people we admire and look up to except 24 hours and what they use it for. We have the same 24 hours in a day as everybody we admire. The difference is what they use it for. Think of your story. Think of your life as a story that is written each and every day. You turn a new page and you fill in the blanks. Some of the details are already there. The family you came from, you can't change that. But you can change the outcome. You can change your destiny. How do you fill in the pages? Who is writing your story? Have you given that pen to somebody else so they have power? Or are you the one in charge? Don't give anybody permission to crush your dreams. Don't leave your plans and your goals on paper. Translate them into actions. As vice gerents, as representatives of Allah, that he has said he has given us what it takes. Shine your light brightly for yourself and for others. Don't let another day go by. Don't let another week go by. Don't let another month go by without bringing the story of who you are to life so that others can benefit from it. May your presence be felt. May your presence be felt. And may your absence be noticed for your significance and for your contribution. And may the people whose lives you have touched all serve as a witness for you in the life to come, starting with your home. May Allah continue to reward this organization, Sisters of Jannah, for putting this event and others and all their activities together to help and benefit others. May Allah continue to strengthen you. For where I may have erred, may Allah forgive me and I ask you to forgive me as well.